This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Well, good morning, and welcome to my very first show of 2023. So you're here with me, Poppy Gibson. I hope you all had a really good break. I must say, I don't know about you, I feel like the Christmas break was already a really long time ago. I feel like we've already been back so busy in our classrooms, in our settings. Um, So it's actually lovely to be back talking to all of you here on Teachers Talk Radio um, and feeling really inspired and enthused, ready for the year ahead. Um, So I'm really excited to be back with you this January and especially excited as we have a very special guest here with us this morning on Teachers Talk Radio to talk about their brand new book. So without further ado, good morning, Ian. Poppy, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Wow, the tech is working. This gets better. <laughs> I'm very well, thanks. How are you doing, Ian? I'm fine, thank you. But I haven't had as an exciting week as you've had at Downing Street. <laughs> oh, this this interview with you is surely going to be the highlight. <laughs> but thank you. It has, it has been a really good week. So this is the cherry on top, really. Uh, because for those of you that have seen the flyers this week and are coming along, we have got Ian Wigston here with us, um, author of two brilliant books. And we're here to kind of focus on the second one, but we will touch on the first because um, I really did enjoy that first book, Ian. Um, how's your week been? It's been quite varied. Um, I've been doing a lot of work with some schools in Nottingham, uh, planning a trip down to the West Country where we're going to visit some schools and also some other businesses. Uh, and I've been doing some writing because we're starting the third book, um, which I'll say a bit more Ooh. about a bit later. Oh, wow. So we've got a whole kind of trilogy of books to, <laughs> to touch Potentially. on Potentially. <laughs> uh, hopefully there'll be some future movies as well. That sounds good. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting you say that because we are going to film a lot of the interviews that we're going to do for the third book because that seems Ooh. to be the way these days. And also um, there's a lot of good you know, visual material that we think we can gather. So, um, so yeah. Oh, fantastic. Great. And actually there's a couple of questions I do want to ask you about um, visual elements of the new book, but we'll get to that all in good time, Ian. We have got an hour together. Uh, welcome everyone that's that's joining us this morning. So um, let's begin. I think before we move on to talking about the books, Ian, I, a little bird tells me you weren't always in education. And so I wondered if maybe you could start off telling us a bit about your background and what's kind of brought you into uh, the writing world and, and working on these books about women in leadership. So originally I was a banker um, and dare I say it when banking was a profession because I've been gone from that for more than 25 years Um, and the last job I did in the bank was running an innovation unit which was the first of its kind uh, in Europe and when I started working in the the consulting world we weren't initially working in education but um, my son was at school in Chelmsford and I went and talked to the head about the work that we were doing And before too long, I was working with him and then also with Mike Gibbons at the Innovation Unit because Mm -hmm. at that time, education consulting, this was around about the time of academisation, wasn't all that well done um, and head teachers didn't have as much autonomy to choose as they have now. How interesting. uh, When Hilary and I got together, Hilary had been a teacher for 30 years and we wanted to start our own business. So Brightfield, which takes its name from a poem by R.S. Thomas. Um, the, f- the field in question is about a field that's got buried treasure, but you had to dig a bit deeper to find the treasure, which is a good metaphor, I think, for a lot of work that we do. Lovely, and I love the, that. Um, it went from there. Fantastic, wow. And, and so now you had uh, the first book, 2021, is that right? Yes. Um, And for anyone who's kind of Googling Ian Wigston as we speak this morning, um, the first book cover, you will see it's kind of two women dangling on ribbons. I can't think what the word is when they're doing that. Uh, Acrobats? They're silk. silk. Okay, so we've we've got this. So you'll see the first book is this image of the two women and then the new book, which we'll mostly be talking about today with you, Ian, um, you'll see has got lots of these images of women's faces. And actually, just before we talk about the books, Ian, I did want to ask, are those women on the front cover of the book actually the women from the case studies? Uh, No, they're actually mentors from our student mentoring programme. 
and uh, we chose those because there was a greater variety of pictures available to us when we were actually sort of trying to get the publication together. But we do have film of all of the people in the second book, uh, and we're going to be putting that on our website very soon. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Ian. OK, so let's go back to where it all began then. Um, let's go back to that very first book. So the first book was called The Magic in the Space Between. Um, can you maybe tell us a bit more about this first title and, and kind of what it was about just to set the scene for us? Yes. So at the time and, and the, for about the last 20 years, my, my coach um, is a chap called David Whitaker, who's now our chairman. And David coached the men's Olympic hockey team that won the gold medal in Seoul. And David was going to write a book about hockey coaching and it was going to be called The Magic in the Space Between. And the space between in this case is the way that a player looks to deceive an opponent by making a run to create space either to receive a pass or to deceive the opponent to think he's going to receive a pass. And David and I were talking about this title and David was going to write the book before he then retired. So mm -hmm. then he offered me the title and I said, well, that would be fantastic. Um, no, no pressure on sort of having a title from your mentor and having to live <laughs> up to it. Um, and of course, it applies to not just sport, but music, theatre, uh, imagery generally. And what it was meant to convey is what happens between a coach and a coachee or between mm -hmm. a mentor and a mentee uh, when you get that question, which just galvanises uh, the person on the other side of the table into realising that there's somewhere that they can go on their thinking and on their journey that they wouldn't have gone before. Wow, I love that. Thank you for explaining the title. And and I think a lot of people will relate. We know that coaching and mentoring is really, you know, in the in the last decade, I personally would say, has come into its own, particularly in education. So I, I really love how you've explained that to us. And because I did wonder where the title came from. Um, and then so in in this book, it was really about talking to head teachers from from states and independent sectors. Is that right? So the origin of the program came from two conversations I had in 2016 with the heads of both the State Girls School Group and uh, the Girls Schools Association. Uh, and Caroline Jordan, who's the head at Headington, uh, said to me, we've got a problem with the pipeline for women leaders. It's not as strong as it needs to be. Uh, what can you do? Uh, and Sharon Cromey, who was at the time the head of Wickham High, said much the same thing a couple of months later. Mm -hmm. So we decided to put those two challenges together. And I had quite a good network of people that I regarded as good mentors. And before too long, we were doing this pro bono. Um, before too long, we had 60 women signed up for the first cohort. Wow. And they were mentored by about 40 different mentors. And they've gone on to have some amazing success either as head teachers or been promoted sort of more generally um, to other roles. Amazing. One or two have left education. Um, and then what happened then was that the pandemic came along um, and, and we found ourselves challenged by how we were going to generate more business, uh, but, but also with an opportunity. That's fantastic. So tell us a bit more about this program. So it has kind of three components, is that right? Yes. So we start by getting the colleagues to apply on an application form and send us their resume or CV. And we then put them through a psychometric questionnaire, the Insights Discovery Questionnaire, Ooh. which is based on the work of Carl Jung. And I then interview them. And so by the time we've had that application form, the psychometric and, and, and the interview, um, we don't use the psychometric to select, but rather just to tell us a bit about sort of where they are in terms of their decision making and thinking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we then put them in touch with a mentor um, from that panel based on the chemistry that I think will exist between the mentor and the mentee. Wow. And so they get four mentoring sessions um, over the course of a year or, or so. Um, but then I was aware of a lot of other mentoring programs and it seemed to me that we needed something else um, ab above the pure mentoring. And so I'd worked with the old SSAT some years previously on their community leadership program. And it struck me that being able to work with a colleague in the opposite sector, um, you know, in one's own geographic neighborhood mm -hmm. on a community project would be a good additional thing for them to do. So what we did where possible was to pair state and independent colleagues um, in particular geographic areas. In fact, by coincidence this morning, 
I've had a text from one of them in Birmingham, Tracy Goodyear, um, who wants to follow up on a project. And Tracy was part of a group we called the Birmingham Three, which did a project on what's called redaxation. So it was reading as an alternative to social media to wow, improve mental health. Um, and often those projects were what was regarded by the colleagues as the, the jewel in the crown. So the mentoring was one thing they could put on their CV, but the project was a second thing. And when mm -hmm. we did our second conference uh, at Godolphin and Latimer in 2019, we filmed a lot of those. And again, they're on YouTube and the links are in the book. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. And I, I think what's really interesting about your books, Ian, is the fact that it is about, you know, teachers are teachers. It shouldn't matter whether you're working in mainstream schools, in independent schools. But actually, you know, we're all facing the same challenges in education. Um, I, I just think that's a really interesting way that you're making these connections between people. Yeah. And, and thank you. And we, we think that what we've created is unique and when we talk about how it's extended overseas becomes even more powerful. And, and what we've also found is that, to your point, a lot of colleagues have worked in both state and independent. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, some of the colleagues who've left education as a consequence of, of being mentored have gone on to do some quite remarkable jobs. One, for example, runs a technology college in the northeast of England. Amazing. Wonderful. So, so tell me a bit more then, Ian, you've, quite, you've touched on it already, but how then did this programme evolve from this kind of UK-based programme that you described in the first book? So we had been working with and talking to um, Megan Murphy, who is the chief executive of the what's now the International Coalition of Girls Schools based in the States. And Megan came to us just around the time of the pandemic and said, we've got a gap in our strategic plan, which looks like a mentoring program. Uh, could you extend it? And I think we'd learned about Zoom about a month before that. So mm -hmm. I said, well, there's this thing called Zoom, which we, we think might work. <laughs> uh, and I'd got contacts with um, colleagues in the States because I'd lived in America uh, as a student, which we'll come to. Um, and so before too long, we had uh, an American group of mentees uh, with American mentors um, and then they were working with the Alliance of Girls Schools Australasia at the same time. Wow. And uh, Lauren Bridge, who, who runs that, came to us and said, you know, we, we'd like to be part of this as well. So before too long, we were starting our mornings in Perth, Australia, and sometimes finishing them in Seattle. Um, and I've now got on my wall, which my daughter gave me, um, a three time zone uh, clock because um, you need to keep track of sort of time zones, especially when they change. Oh, so, I love that. Fantastic. So you've gone global with this really then, Ian? Par paradoxically, the pandemic was a, was a boost for us and we've been able to sustain that and uh, develop that so that we've now had you know, more than 200 women go through the programme overall uh, and we're on the, the fifth cohort. Wow, that's fantastic. That's wonderful. And and kind of out of those 200, generally kind of how how well have those partnerships worked with them? Very well indeed. Um, it's a bit like sort of pairing people up in, in Strictly Come Dancing. Um, <laughs> okay. you, you need to make sure that the moves are going to be consistent with one another and, you know, mm -hmm. not their heights, but sort of their, their chemistry is right. And I think out of those sort of 200, less than a handful have been you know problems in terms of not getting on or sort of not feeling that they've got the right chemistry uh, and in fact inevitably many of the relationships that have developed ha have gone on and gone past the the formal program and, wow. and friendships have been made and in fact we've got a number of the colleagues who've said once the program is finished i'd like to carry on working with x um, and i'll pay for that myself Wow, I love that. That's fantastic. It shows what a good job that kind of application process and, you know, the testing, it, it really kind of shows, shows you more about that person to match them up. That's fantastic. Well, one of my golfing friends said, said to me that uh, one, one of the challenges that he thought that this uh, helped to address is that, you know, ed education relative to other industries can be quite inward looking. Um, mm -hmm. And quite a few of the women that came on the program had only worked in education, in some cases had worked in just a single school. And so the opportunity to look outside of that school and to look outside of themselves was something that they found in incredibly powerful um, and incredibly sort of inspirational um, in, wow. in the way that they've responded. Incredible. Um, 
the next thing I really wanted to ask you about, um, I was really interested where in the introduction, you talk about a visit that you made to the Kennedy Library. And I wonder if you maybe tell, tell us a bit more about that and um, kind of what that was about. So this was the global forum at the, for the International Coalition of Girls' Schools that took place in Boston in June last year. Oh, wow. And uh, I got there a couple of days early because I'd never been to Boston, not for a while, and wanted to have a look around. And the JFK Library is, is one of a number of presidential libraries uh, that exist in various cities around North America. And I was keen to go to it, partly because I was around when, when John Kennedy was shot in 1963, I'm, I'm that old, um, but more <laughs> because when I was living in America in 1968, um, my social studies teacher was a big Bobby Kennedy fan. And um, there was a room at the John Kennedy Library dedicated to Bobby because wow. uh, when John was um, president, Bobby was his attorney general. So they've recreated the room, which looks like Bobby Kennedy's office. Wow. And I got chatting to a very helpful uh, man at the desk. Um, and we discovered that we got a shared interest in Bobby. And um, I, I was waiting to meet another colleague who was late arriving uh, on her plane. Uh, and so I was chatting to him for quite a while. And after a while, you know, somewhat conspiratorially, he got out this um, large envelope. And he said, I think you'll like this. And inside it was a 1968 campaign poster. Wow. And I just thought, OK, wow, thank you. That, that, that's very kind. Um, and I didn't look at it in detail because I wanted to make sure that I didn't damage it or you know, tear it or anything whilst I was mm -hmm. at the museum. And it was only when I got back to the hotel and, and, and looked at it that my sort of my jaw dropped um, because what it was, it was a campaign post 1968. Wow. And it's showing Bobby you know, campaigning. But the punchline uh, just moved me. And the punchline says, the youth of our nation are the clearest mirror of our performance. And in a few words, especially just about to go to an education conference, uh, I was gobsmacked. Wow, beautiful. So is that framed somewhere now, Ian? It's going to be. Um, and it's also been used in at least one speech day speech by, by one of our colleagues. Beautiful. That's wonderful. Okay, so let's get on to the book. I'm, I'm dying to focus on the book now. So um, this book published by the brilliant John Cat, and you can, uh, anyone listening, if you're interested, jump onto the John Cat Bookshop website. Um, you'll see it, this lovely image covered with women's faces on the front cover. Um, I must say, Ian, normally when, when I buy an educational book, I'll take the time to think what are the themes in the book and I'll flick through. And there's normally maybe one or two that catch my eye. And I think these are the most important. I might not read the others, but I've got to say, you've kind of got four key themes for this book and I love them all. I'll just be really <laughs> transparent. And the hardest thing for me with your book was thinking, which one am I going to read first? <laughs> because right. they all, they're all really interesting for me. So, you know, I was a primary school teacher before I'm now lecturing in education. And, and I think these themes you have picked out and we'll, we'll talk about them um, now. All of them are so relevant as we're pushing forward in this kind of post-pandemic 2023 um, classroom. Uh, so, yeah, I was just like, can we maybe chat through the themes? Are you happy mm. for us to kind of talk about what the four key themes? And I think for anyone listening, th this is going to make you want to buy this book because <laughs> you've picked four really, really good themes that I think we will all relate with. So, in a sense, uh, and the key point to make is that the, the themes came about as a result of the mentees mm. choosing these topics. So what we've got here in the book are a series of papers written by some amazing women who have co collaborated you know, from around the world. So in some cases, we've got stu uh, people in Australia collaborating with people in the UK. And when they were presenting their papers, they were meeting face to face for the first time, sometimes wow. just a day before they were presenting the papers. Wow. Um, amazing. And I was fortunate because when I came to look at what they'd chosen, um, they did fall into these these four themes. So the first theme is is student well-being, um, and and that's looked at from a variety of points of view, both in terms of social media, uh, in terms of mental health, uh, and, and so on. Um, the second theme is pedagogy and curriculum. Uh, the third is is professional development, and and one of the things about professional development, which comes out also in the first book is the amount of time which education colleagues get to have devoted to their professional development, which mm -hmm. by comparison with other sectors that we work in is, is much smaller and much less. 
So therefore, what you have to do is to make sure that the quality of, of what's there it more than makes up for the lack of time. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's spend. a good point. Um, and then life after school is 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 the is is the fourth thing. And and given that that's covered by colleagues from Africa, North America, New Zealand, and and, and Australia, um, there's a really interesting cross section um, of papers there. Fantastic. Is is there? A- I've got to say, if I had to pick out of those four themes, I think the one on student well-being, although all of those themes are central to us as educators, I think that that one really resonated with me, you know, thinking how we are best supporting these learners. Is is there one of those four themes that kind of you particularly enjoyed bringing together there, Ian? If I pick out one from that section, um, Poppy, um, the, there's a paper called the Deifi- about the deification of social media influencers. So let me perhaps back up slightly. So one of the people that was in, in that um, paper is a woman called Poonam Bent. And Poonam is actually the chaplain of a girls' school in Sydney, Pimble. And because she had a somewhat unusual position in the school relative to other teaching staff, um, mm-hmm. I thought she needed a different type of mentor. So um, a good friend of mine is um, the Right Reverend Martin Seeley, who is the Bishop of St Edmund's Bree and Ipswich. Uh, and Martin's a good enough friend. Uh, and Poonam actually had had both her father and her grandfather had been bishops. So I decided wow. that a, an Anglican bishop would be a good person um, t- t- to mentor her. Um, and she worked with uh, Kate Horton, who's at St Catherine's Bramley. And the two of them really got on like a house on fire and i of all of the projects i got regular sort of updates from either one or both of them uh, just saying on how, how rich you know their conversations that they were having so these were the conversations that they had with themselves plus of course they had their conversations with their mentors mm-hmm. um and so when i i got this title um from from punam originally uh, i just thought wow okay deification of social media influence i mean apart from anything else that's you know somewhat headline grabbing Um, (laughs) um, and they were fortunate enough as well as working with the students in their own schools in Australia uh, and the UK Mm -hmm. um, Poonam has Indian connections and uh, a school in Joy India was also used to to do part of the surveying so you've got students from three countries talking about how social media and social media influence was was having an impact on them Wow, and wonderful. What they brought out was the extent to which that can be a positive influence, but 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 also if if one's not careful, how algorithms can take control of your life. And um one one of the initiatives that they had got was that the sixth forms in Pimble um, have their own Instagram group, which they use as a way of encouraging and pointing younger students to positive sites which will give them uh, helpful advice uh, r- rather than some of the less invidious sites or more invidious sites I should say that sort of might take them down particular rabbit holes. Wonderful I love that so for, for anyone listening that treats themselves to Ian's brand new book um, Deification of Social Media Influences is, is a really good one can you tell us maybe just before we we cut for, for the news Ian what are a couple of other papers that really stand out for you in the book that you would you would like to highlight for us? Yeah, so Claire Duncan at Wimbledon High um, did both an excellent paper, but also a brilliant film uh, on neurodiversity. So the paper's called Embracing Individuality, How Do We Find a Way of Increasing Understanding and Acceptance of Neurodiversity and Hidden Differences Within Our School Community? And one of the quotes that um, I just want to pick out from that, um, they spoke to some students, uh, one of whom had it was autistic, uh, and let me just quote um, from this, um, this student. I take longer to form sentences and transfer my thoughts into speech because I need to order the words in my head before I say them out loud. This doesn't mean I don't know what to say. I just don't know how to say it. The thought in my head is mostly made up of words and images floating around, which I need to ground and place into coherent English before speaking. If I say what passes through my head, no one will understand the few completely unrelated words I just said. So I have to completely pre-prepare my sentences, otherwise I don't make sense. Wow, I love just that that rawness of that. That's incredible to have that insight, isn't it, to how that student was feeling? 
yeah. And um, the, the other two papers I'd, I, I, I would perhaps pick out, um, one is called Mind the Gap, um, mm -hmm. which is by Erin Skelton, who's an assistant head at Nottingham Girls High. Uh, and that talks about her experience in working in a variety of state and independent schools on the cultural uh, gap um, and some of the different um, elements that she's encountered in, in her teaching. Um, so, for example, um, she talks about 15 years of experience uh, finding a complex intersection between bias, both unconscious and overt, uh, the impact of low socioeconomic status, parental mm -hmm. input and teacher expectations, you know, held up by the system used to track progress nationally. So it's a very thoughtful paper uh, across a wide um, variety of um, institutions. Um, and then Maggie Powers and Diana Kelly, they created a playbook. So uh, this is a playbook for teaching the skills and mindsets needed in a diverse and changing workplace. Uh, cool. Diana is actually a, a librarian uh, in a school in Australia, uh, and Maggie works in uh, the States. And uh, what they have created is, is literally a, a series of activities and a series of uh, interventions uh, that students can help to use in order to think about sort of what, uh, what different expectations the workplace uh, and universities have uh, once they have left school. Wow, how interesting. See, these are definitely on my to-do list now. <laughs> now, I, now you've picked out these really good four, but uh, I mean, the whole book just is absolutely fantastic. Um, on that note, because there's so many more things that I want to ask you, and I know we all want to hear about the new book. Uh, we're we're going to take a break for the news and everything now, Ian, but we'll join you again in about eight minutes to talk more about your fantastic new book, okay? I look forward to it. Thanks, right, Poppy. Talk to you soon. This show is brought to you in partnership this show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading! This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. Strike action dominates the news again, with a range of outlets reporting on disputes across England, Wales and Scotland. Whilst the NASUWT union reported 9 out of 10 teachers who voted in a ballot overpay, voted in favour of strike action in England and Wales, the union also reported only a 42% turnout. This is below the threshold needed for lawful strike action. The union stated that whilst a strike would now not The NEU is yet to release the results of its ballot and will also need to reach the 50% member turnout needed for lawful industrial action. In Scotland, the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association has warned of further strike action following walkouts by secondary staff. It says it has no option unless the Scottish Government puts forward a suitable pay offer. The EIS Union and Scottish NASUWT members also aim to continue with strike action until an agreement is reached. Scottish Education Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville maintains that the demand for a 10% pay rise continues to be unaffordable. Meanwhile, the University and College Union has announced 15 new strike days planned across 150 UK universities in February and March. It has said that a pay offer worth between 4 and 5% made during recent talks is not enough, although the group representing university employers says that the offer is actually worth up to 7%. This comes after the government announced that tuition fees in England will be frozen for another two years. Although this is good news for students, the strikes mean courses already affected by the pandemic. However, the National Union of Students has been broadly supportive of the industrial action at least so far. Away from strike action, there have been further stories focusing on what should be taught in schools.
This time, the focus is on educating pupils in the dangers of social media in spreading messages that are misogynistic and deeply toxic. The HuffPost website reports on Labour MP Alex Davy-Jones, who called in Parliament for ministers to do more to stamp out Andrew Tate-style misogyny and to stop boys being brainwashed. The MP asked what was being done to tackle radicalisation of young men. But PM Rishi Sunak responded that he was proud that this government launched the world-leading, world-first online safety bill. He also made reference to the autumn statement announcement of £2 billion of extra funding to schools. Although he did not respond with any direct reference to Tate, the online safety bill is expected to complete its final stages in the Commons shortly, before heading to the House of Lords. New figures released recently show that school absences in December were almost double the annual rate and that this was due to illness. The absence rate, as reported in the Evening Standard, was 14.3% across state schools in the week beginning December the 12th, an increase from 7.8% across the year. The Department for Education in England said the increase was due to a rise in sick days as a result of winter illnesses such as flu, as well as COVID-19 and strep A infections such as scarlet fever. In the Channel Island of Jersey, BBC News reports that the government has brought in 11 UK supply teachers to cover for absent staff. The short-term and long-term measures have been put in place due to staffing shortages and the supply teachers will cover for up to two terms. Short-term housing has been organised for those travelling to the island. The Jersey government said the current vacancy rate for Jersey was 4.3%, but that the long-term plan was to train, recruit, retain and upskill school staff. Finally, the Meanwhile in the Middle East section of the CNN website reports on the United Arab Emirates' plan to become the first Arab nation to teach about the Holocaust in its schools. The move has been praised by some and criticised by others. The nation revealed its plans in a recent tweet and intends to include Holocaust education in both primary and secondary schools. The UAE says it will work with Tel Aviv and Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Jerusalem, to help build the new curriculum. Whilst many see the move as part of the normalisation of relations with Israel, critics suggest that it does not reflect all of those living in the UAE, with many disagreeing with this policy. Full details of the story can be found on the CNN website, with comments on both sides explored in detail. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, let's start the new year with investigating the power of artificial intelligence in education. A lot of people are asking, does your school block chat GPT? First of all, what is it? Chat Generative Pre-trained Transformer, or GPT for short, is a piece designed to mimic talking to a person. The difference is this person is super clever and it's been trained by thousands of conversations in the past and it remembers them all. There are lots of chatbots out there. GPT is popular with young people as the answers it gives are not only correct but can be slightly different each time so it's more difficult for a teacher to spot a copy and paste homework. Let's put it to the test with a couple of school questions. I'm using a screen reader to represent ChatGPT to give it a voice. Responses are usually in text and appear as if they're being typed really quickly. I asked, what are the registers in a processor? And I got... Registers are a type of memory that is built into the central processing unit, CPU, of a computer. They are used to store data and instructions that the CPU needs to access quickly in order to perform its functions. There are different types of registers, each with a specific purpose. For example, the instruction register stores the current instruction that the CPU is executing, while the program counter register stores the address of the next instruction to be executed. I'll stop GPT there as three paragraphs were given in this answer, and it's only a one or two mark question. So I asked, can you tell me in two sentences? And I got... Registers are small, high-speed memory units built into the central processing unit, CPU, of a computer that are used to store data and instructions. They allow the CPU to access and manipulate data and instructions quickly, enabling it to carry out complex tasks at high speeds. Well, thank you, GPT. That's much more to the point. Powerful, right? How about, can you summarise Of Mice and Men? Of Mice and Men is a novella by John Steinbeck, published in 1937. It tells the story of George Milton and Lenny Small, two displaced migrant ranch workers during the Great Depression in California. Despite their apparent differences, the two men are deeply bonded and rely on each other for companionship and support. The novella ends tragically when Lenny, a simple-minded man with a love for soft things, accidentally kills a ranch owner's wife while trying to touch a soft dress, and George is forced to make the difficult decision to euthanize Lenny before he can be punished for the crime. 
That's fantastic. However, there's some words in there that are quite big and my teacher would be quite suspicious that I copied and pasted it. So I'll ask, can you summarise of Mice and Men simply? Mice and Men is a story about two ranch workers, George and Lenny, who are travelling together and looking for work during the Great Depression. Lenny is a large, simple-minded man with a love for soft things and George is his caretaker and protector. Despite their differences, the two men are deeply bonded and rely on each other for companionship and support. However, their relationship is ultimately tested when Lenny accidentally kills a ranch owner's wife and George is forced to make a difficult decision to protect Lenny from the consequences of his actions. That's more like it. Now my homework's done, I think I just bought myself some more time on my games console. As always, I'd love to hear what you want to know about tech. Let us know at TT Radio Official. I'm Steve Woods and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods. Your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. So, welcome back, everybody, to the second half of the show with me, Poppy Gibson, here on Teachers Talk Radio. And I'm very excited to say that we are joined today by the brilliant author, Ian Wigston. Uh, Welcome back, Ian. Poppy, thank you. It was fascinating listening to that piece on the news about uh, social media, uh, which uh, resonated yes. very strongly indeed. After which we've just been talking about. Indeed. <laughs> um, just for anyone just joining us, I just want to um, talk again to our listeners about Ian, why you're here. So Ian's written two fantastic books about women in leadership. The first, The Magic in the Space Between, uh, came out 2021. But the one we're really talking about today is the second book, The Magic in the Space Beyond, Transformational Case Studies from the Frontiers of Women's Leadership, both available from the brilliant John Catt uh, bookshop website. But let's carry on talking. Just before the break that in, we were talking about the the second book um, and Mm. these brilliant case studies. And I think a, a lot of people listening will agree with me that I love a case study. Um, I think it's such a great way to see how people feel, how they're responding to the challenges in education. Um, so for anyone who's thinking about buying a book for their upcoming holiday, which we hopefully are going to try and take this year, this is a fantastic and, and very accessible read, I think, to add to your wish list. So let's talk a bit more about the book, Ian. Um, this book is all about women in mentoring programmes. And I know one of the papers that you read before the break was written by someone called Erin is that right that's right Erin Skelton yeah so I just I just thought that um sorry that Ian so I just thought that um for Erin's journey as a mentee was one that really kind of resonated and interested me so what do you think Erin really gained from that mentoring program and unfortunately I know she can't be here today but you know in her words I know she's spoken with you about her experience what what do you think Erin would say so so Erin um interestingly was was born in Canada and has spent uh, the last 20 years or so in, in the UK so she's got a, a global approach to her, her education philosophy um, and I was chatting to her before today and um, I asked her what she felt she gained from the program and she said it's unique in its field um, it's not about improving a specific element of your practice or preparing you for the next rung on the ladder of educational leadership going through the insights psychometric process it's a very powerful tool self-reflection and then when you're paired with you know the chemistry of an exceptional mentor suddenly it's not simply about your ability to perform in the classroom or at school it's about you your talents your purpose your ambitions Uh, and then to be able to harness that into a piece of research or a project is a rare gift that, that most teachers and leaders don't get the time or the forum to achieve what was also interesting was that one of the other colleagues um, on the, on the program when we started it originally it was doing the interviews in sort of july and august mm-hmm. and she said that, and wrote to me that before she went back into school at the start of term that september she was the most motivated that she had been as a result of uh, the, the work that we had done together that was before you know the, the mentoring had really got underway she had one mentoring session and so I think it's important to stress that we're not just about getting women into uh, more senior positions. It's also about their day-to-day performance and, and how that can improve. 
Wow, so interesting and re really great to hear Erin's um, kind of experience of how she experienced that mentorship program. To be honest, Ian, you're making me want to leave uh, to leave lecturing and go back to being in the school so I can try and get onto this incredible program. <laughs> well, I'm sure That's we could wonderful. have a conversation about sort of, you know, possible mentoring opportunities, Poppy. <laughs> oh, don't you get me too excited now, Ian. <laughs> um, so, so let's talk more again about Erin. So I think what was really interesting for me was uh, and for anyone who reads the book definitely pick out where um erin's parts are erin opted to focus her research on educational policy and pedagogy um and focus on her career rather than her experiences in any one school and mm. i wondered um had erin kind of spoken to you about what brought her to that decision well, originally, we, we'd paired her in with a colleague in North America that was going to look at something very similar. But unfortunately, you know, sometimes the pairings don't work out, not because of any personal difference, but just because that leader's circumstances changed. She actually had a move and wasn't able to give as much time to the, the project. She was still being mentored. Um, and so what Erin did in the end, in, with, under her mentor and, and my supervision, um, you know, she said, you know, Participating in that enabled her to think holistically across her own teaching experiences and it allowed her to bring in her unique experiences of being a student in, in Canada in a non-UK mm -hmm. setting. Um, and she said that she'd always probably thought of educational pedagogy through a global lens and there's always been that comparison for her. So to be able to look at the, the UK education system via a holistic teacher's eye view seemed to be the obvious path for me to take in my research. Um, and I was chatting to her just the other day um, and she's hoping eventually to develop that into a master's and, and, and a PhD, not wow. specifically on those themes, but that's her um, intellectual ambition. Exciting, wonderful. And I'm sure, you know, that the way that she, she writes so fluently for your book shows that she's definitely got that aptitude to take forward. So good luck to Erin. Please pass on my best wishes. <laughs> I will. Um, really interesting. I think that's what's great about your book, The Magic in the Space Beyond, because it's bringing together women's voices, as you say, from different sectors of education, from around the world, from different cultures and contexts. And I think that's what makes the book so interesting for me. Would you agree? I think it is. And, and, and I think there's two things. It, it's that point, but also the fact that on top of a busy teaching day, teaching or leadership day, what we were asking these women to do throughout the pandemic, bear in mind, was also to uh, make time for being mentored and, and the preparation and the follow up from that, and also make time to write a paper in collaboration with someone they'd only met via Zoom. So, so mm -hmm. I think that there's a you know an anthropological plus to all of that um that sort of we're in danger of sort of o overlooking if, if we just say well look at the book and if you sort of look at what's underneath the book, if you like um there were some quite remarkable you know sacrifices that these women made in in order mm -hmm. to do the program but you know in the vast majority of cases you know to to their positive ben benefit Wonderful. And I know you, you briefly told us um, in the first part of the show, Ian, kind of where these women have got on to, but could, could you maybe expand a bit more where all, all these women, I know you said you've had, I think, 200 women go through the programme in the last six years, but where are these colleagues now? So many of them have been promoted. So in fact, from the first cohort of 60, which was going back to, to 2017, more than 50% have had some kind of promotion. And by promotion, we mean either that they've got a, a more senior role, mm -hmm. or in some cases that they've moved out of education into other positions. Um, there was a group of four women in particular uh, from the first cohort and collectively they'd worked in four schools for a total of 48 years before the mentoring started wow since then those same four women have had eight promotions between them including one who's ahead one has left education and now runs a technology college in the northeast and one has written a book which is going to be published uh, later this year um, wow wonderful the, it was interesting. In, in, in the first book, um, I quote Mary Catherine Bateson, who's the daughter of the anthropologist Margaret Mead, because um, she explored um, in her book Composing a Life, uh, which was published in 1991, um, the challenges faced by women. And, and she talked about, you know, the stop start nature of women's lives, their multiple roles and responses describing what she referred to as a creative process, which was like an improvisatory art. So 
a lot of what women have to do in order to maintain their careers is a lot more improvisation and juggling than would be the case for men. <laughs> yeah, I can definitely relate to that. As a as a mother of three and a women leader, I can definitely relate to some of those challenges. So, uh, yeah, really, really interesting, Ian. So, um, so I have to ask. I know we've mentioned the two books, uh, both available through the brilliant JohnCatBookshop.com website. My question is then, what is next? What what is coming next? So. I hinted that we're starting to write a third book, um, so it'll be hopefully some kind of trilogy with a working title, "The Magic in the Space Beneath." Um, and oh, the thing- I, did, I did wonder what the verb was called. <laughs> what the uh, what is it called? Uh, the magic in the space beneath. Yeah. The, the, what's the word that describes the word where something is placed? Um, you know, so I guess you went from the magic in the space between to beyond. Oh, preposition. To- Preposition, yeah, preposition. Yeah. Okay, and, clever. And, and you kept them all with Bs as well. Well, I like <laughs> so far, so far. And, and we're kind of going back to the pipeline idea. So this idea of a pipeline of women's leadership. And is it a question of repairing a pipeline which isn't working or perhaps mm-hmm. starting with, it, with, with a different pipeline? So, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to send out a questionnaire to each of the mentees uh, and ask them to talk about their experiences of being mentored and, and, and what it's meant for them and what they've gone on to do since. Um, and also talk about some of their broader personal circumstances to try and get get a picture of the back cloth to, um, prior to where they came on the mentoring program. So there'll be the responses to those questionnaires. Um, there'll then be a series of case studies. So we're going to delve deeper into some of the cases uh, of, of the women as leaders uh, and explore Brilliant. the challenges that they've had. Uh, and then what we're hoping to do is to make a series of policy recommendations because we do see there being some things that education leaders in government, not just in this country, but you know around the world could make. And, and there are different pressures and, and different climates that apply in in the different territories that we've worked in um mm-hmm. and you know w- one of our um, speakers I've not, I've not mentioned her um is a maths teacher who was originally born in Soweto and um, she did a paper on the idea of belonging in maths um which wow, I haven't mentioned earlier but but is really interesting in terms of the difference that for a subject that not all of us take too easily um the idea of belonging in a classroom and, and what a teacher can do to enable and inform that belonging um, was was a really powerful metric for her. How interesting! We don't often think of maths as being that emotional, so that's a really that sounds really interesting. Can we find that in the second book? That's in the second book. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and then thinking back to to Brightfield that you set up, then where do you think Brightfield is heading in terms of the future of educational leadership? Well. We work in schools and we work in the the, the corporate world as well. Most of it is in in education. And really since 2016, most of our work in schools has been in in, in girls' schools. So we see, you know, the the other side of the equation is that there's an awful lot of boys and co-ed schools that we haven't yet sort of developed strong relationships with. Uh, And we think that there are some learnings that we can take from what we've understood from the last few years, but, but also some different things and but the process of mentoring for male leaders and for you know future male leaders um is as important different um but certainly will benefit from this kind of holistic approach that we think we can bring um and and we've got lots and lots of evidence and lots and lots of data um yeah so that's going to be our, our our focal point and we also want to use the fact that we've now got you know 200 people who have been graduates of this scheme exactly, because they're yeah. they're now starting to be the mentors for the next generation um so i mentioned tracy goodyear who was on the first cohort she's now working in a a, a trust in the in the midlands and, and rang me this morning just to inquire about some work that we, we we might do together we've also developed a student mentoring program so uh, we did a pilot program last year some of the women who are mentors on that are on the, the cover of the, the Magic in the Space Beyond. Um, but what we're looking to try and do there is to bring some of the um, 
models and practices from the grown-up program to, to the student program. And we did a pilot mm -hmm. of 45 students and we're just about, in, about starting to recruit the next cohort, which will be global. And so colleagues in uh, Nottingham, for example, will work with students in Australia um, wow. and, and they will also do a project. So they'll have mentoring, they've had the insights, they've had the application interview, and they will also do um, what we're calling a social impact project. Wow, this sounds amazing. Good luck to the next cohort. That was very exciting on the horizon. Um, I've, I've just got a couple of questions left really in before we finish. I, can't, I feel like time flies when you're having fun. We're already coming to the <laughs> end of our, of our chat today. Um, the first question I wanted to ask for any people listening, you know, whoever they are, wherever they're working, or particularly women um, who are looking to get into leadership, like some of these stories we've heard through your two books, we obviously don't all have the advantage of getting onto your brilliant um, mentoring programme. What advice would you give these women who've got that ambition, they have that drive, but maybe they're not quite sure how to take that next step? Have you maybe please just got some kind of generic advice for, for women who want to go to the next level? It's a great question. Um, I, I think there's two things. Um, one would be to read widely, and I don't just mean our two books, um, to, to read widely because there is a growing volume of material. Um, many of the books we quoted at the end of, um, in the bibliography for our first book, um, about other mentoring programs. Um, but then I think try and seek out somebody uh, outside of the school environment, uh, whether it's a governor, um, or a friend or colleague who works in, in, in a different sector, uh, may, maybe somebody who works you know, as, as a coach or, a, or as an advisor. But because what, one of the things, and this came out also in the SSAT work that I did, bearing in mind that colleagues there were looking at community leadership, frequently they were working outside the school gates uh, for the first time. And, mm -hmm. and the biggest challenge for them was how to translate what they knew about their teaching expertise into the context of their community. Um, one of the really interesting points that John Cridland, um, John used to run the CBI and, and was the big driver behind a book called First Steps, which the CBI put out some years ago on education. And he made the point, that he was a mentor for us, and he made the point that the women that he coached had got skill levels which were much better than many equivalent people in the corporate world. And yet, because they only had the somewhat narrow confines of, of, of a school against which to compare themselves, didn't assess mm -hmm. themselves as being that good. And, and so one of the key things that the programme does is to give them you know, that different context. And if you can't get access to a formal programme, then try and see if you can find a mentor um, or somebody that can be you know, a friendly coach or advisor. When I worked in the bank, um, I had this and, and one of the people that I used to have a lunch with every year was a chap who went on to become the head of HR. Um, and he was a really useful person to be able to sort of take me outside my very narrow context and just mm -hmm. sort of see what my career looked like uh, as, as a thing over a period of time. That's brilliant. So really good advice that Ian, for anyone listening who's thinking of trying to move up into leadership or progress their career, find a mentor. <laughs> so I really like that. Don't, don't be shy, find someone, a more experienced person maybe in your, in your network that, that might be willing to support you and just ask them. I suppose you've got nothing to lose. They can only say no. You well, can ask and, also, else. <laughs> and, and also do write to me because I'm very happy to, you know, we know people in different parts of the country. Um, and it may well be that one of our mentors, you know, is close to whichever school uh, the oh, colleague wow, is inquiring fantastic. from. So, so no, do my, my contact details are on the website. So, so do feel free to get in touch. Thank you, Ian. So that was Ian Wigston saying he's happy for um, anyone who's looking to get into leadership to pop him a message. And I've just got one last question, please, Ian, before you go. Um, I wondered, just, just to top it all off, because leadership is a really, I wouldn't say contested, but a really almost ambiguous term, I think. And I know at university, I actually, um, I did a leadership course before Christmas and, and part of it was just thinking about actually what is leadership, you know, what does it mean to be a leader? So I just wondered, just in your opinion, before we finish, if, if you had to say maybe three qualities that you think a good leader has, maybe that you've picked up from your book or that, you know, the women have reflected upon, what, 
what three qualities do you really think a leader needs to have to be a successful leader? So I think resilience is probably the top of my list mm, and, and that's a good one. Me me mental health in, in relationship to that. Um, integrity. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I'll tell a story about this. When I was in the bank, I went on a course that was about leadership and we were asked to list what leadership qualities we thought were important. And the um, one of them was integrity. And only two of us out of the 20 people on the course listed integrity. And this was just after the scandal with Bering Brothers and Nick Leeson. And when we were challenged on that, we said, well, unless you make it explicit, there's a danger that if it's only tacit, it gets lost under mm. pressure of day to day work. So that would be the second. And then the third would be having a very clear set of personal values. Um, when we set up Brightfield, one of the things that we spent a lot of time on at the outs were what were the values of the organization. And the thing about values is if they save you a lot of time, because if you get asked to make a decision, and it conflicts with your values, then you can say automatically, well, no, sorry, we won't do that piece of work. We won't make that decision because it yep. contradicts that value. Whereas if you don't have those values, what you have to do is to start from first principles and go back and say, well, what do we really think about that? And A, that can be time consuming and you may not have the time. Fantastic. Really good advice. So resilience, integrity and sticking to your values. I love that, Ian. That's that's so valuable for us to hear your perspective. So um, that does bring us to the end of our session. Have you got any, anything you finally want to say as, as we finish for today, Ian? No, just thank you for this opportunity. It, it's it's great to be able to share this with, with, with a wider audience. Um, we're hopeful that um, more people will read the books, but also that more women will feel that leadership in whatever form it takes is, is something which they can take on Qu quite quite often you know w women who've come on the program they've been nominated by their heads and mm -hmm. they said well the head thinks i've got this but i don't think i have and then guess what two or three months later they're moved into a new new role and, and right and say wow. you know what this has really made a difference Love it. That's fantastic, Ian. Really positive uh, vibes to end our session today. So I just want to thank you so much, Ian, for coming on to Teachers Talk Radio. For anyone listening, buy the book. I cannot recommend it enough. The Magic in the Space Beyond. But you can also see Ian's first book as well, Magic in the Space Between, both available from John Cat. Um, and Ian, hopefully we'll talk again very soon. I look forward to it, Poppy. And thank you for the idea about the film. <laughs> if you need any, you know, starring female uh, protagonists. <laughs> I know where to you find know, you. Contact me. <laughs> All right. Have a lovely weekend, Ian. And you. Take care. Take care. Goodbye. Bye. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio. is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out! Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading! This is Teachers